Good morning, Community Life. Today, we will be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 9, and verse 57 through 62. At this time, ushers will be walking down the aisles with Bibles. If you do not have one, or you might know someone that needs one, please feel free to take one home today. It is our gift to you. If you are reading from those Bibles, you can find today's text on page 815. This is the word of God. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your eternal grace, your tender mercies, and your unbound love. Thank you for anointing Pastor Matthew today to deliver a message powered by your Holy Spirit directly from you, that we as believers deepen our grasp on truly following you, on leaving the old behind no matter the cost, on Christ being the center of everything, aligning with your will for us, and having a, a unwavering pursuit of proclaiming your kingdom. If there are those among us who are yet to believe, I pray your word soften their hearts as you speak directly through Pastor Matthew, that your agape love and eternal truth become the most real thing they have ever heard. That they might say today, Jesus, I repent, I believe, you are my Lord. And when you say the words, follow me, no matter the cost, our response will be, yes, Lord, I will. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Hey, you may have a seat. You know, we are finishing up this week. Uh, this is our last week in the sermon series, First Things First, where we've looked at uh, the disciplines of our faith. We've asked some good questions. I um, mean, we like to do this at the beginning of every year just to kind of get a good reset and a foundation um, for what we're trying to do as a church and what we believe. We've asked things like, what is the gospel? What do Christians do? How should Christians see themselves? Why the church and why do we be a member of the church? And then last week we looked at, how do we pray? And throughout all these foundations, we get to see that in light of the gospel, which we said was Jesus in my place for my sins, that in light of that, in light of this foundational idea of God becoming man and dying in our place for our sins, that there is a different way of living other than what the world has to offer. There's just a different way, a better way. And through all this, we got to see the, what does a Christian do? Well, we do prayer, Bible, church. We lean into the Word of God. We lean into the ear of God when we pray, and we comprise the church as the people of God. Why? Because of Jesus in my place for my sins. See, today I want to talk about a principle that I know to be true. The truth of Jesus Christ demands a response. There is no such thing as indifference to Jesus. I could take him or leave him. No, that's not true. You're either with Jesus, you are in Christ, having repented of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you are in Christ. Or you are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Both are true of both parties, but one has put their faith in Jesus and the other has not. There is no indifference to Jesus. The truth of Jesus demands a response. So the question I have today as we finish up first things first, here's my question that I endeavor to answer. What would it cost to follow Jesus? We've spent the first few weeks of this series saying, okay, th this is the gospel, Jesus in my place for my sins, this is what a Christian does, this is what, how we pray, this is what we should think of ourselves, all that's true. But then it kind of culminates with this idea of a question, will you follow Jesus? Will you repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus, and will you obey him, will you follow him? And if the answer Yes, you, you might be thinking, well, what does it cost? Surely what you're talking about, that kind of life change, would cost me something. Because that is what Jesus is asking of us, that we would follow him. That we would repent of our sins and follow him. 
that sounds nice, but what would it look like in our lives? And that's where we get to Luke 9 today. So if you look, look at verse 57 with me. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here's my first point as we answer the question, what would it cost to follow Jesus? Following Jesus is uncomfortable. Following Jesus is uncomfortable. As we kind of get the context for where we are in Luke 9, this is not Jesus speaking in definitives. It's not 100% reality. There was, it's not that Jesus never had a place to lay his head. That's not true. We know at some places he stayed at, at Peter's house, and you know Peter gave him a place to lay his head. We, we Surely there were times when Jesus had comforts. So please don't read this as literal of, of Jesus saying, oh, I never slept on a bed, and so all you guys are going to go home and like throw out all your beds. That's not what Jesus is saying. And at this point in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is getting ready to make the trek to Jerusalem where he will be arrested, killed, beaten, mocked, and scorned. He will be denied. So the bigger point that Jesus is really making is that to follow Jesus means that at times it's not going to be easy or comfortable. Now that's not really a super like good sales pitch for following Jesus. But it's true. Jesus is telling us that following Jesus doesn't mean that we will just imitate his life. I think a lot of people say, you know, what would Jesus do? And I think that's good. We should ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? We should desire to imitate Jesus in the way he lived his life. But what Jesus is saying right here is that it's not just about imitating his life and his virtues, but that we often will experience the same uncomfortable conditions of life that he experienced. Jesus said, don't be surprised when the world hates you. It hated me first because I'm not of this world. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are not of this world. And this idea of comfort, well, you think about it, comfort is really the enemy of progress. Rarely do you hear of someone being comfortable and really advancing in something, right? If I only did workouts that I was super comfortable in, I would probably never get stronger, right? If I, if I only learned things that were comfortable for me to learn, well, I probably wouldn't learn very much, if you were trying to grow a business, if you only did things that made you comfortable, well, that business would probably never grow. If you endeavor to finish a degree, you were going to have to be uncomfortable. But it's often through discomfort that we see the most growth. The way I think about this is I have two beautiful daughters. I have a, a five-year-old and an almost two-year-old. And I think of all the attributes I want for them, some of the attributes I want for them is to be strong and to be brave. I want both of those things to be true of my girls, that they would be strong and that they would be brave. But there is no reality in which either of my girls grows up to be strong or brave if they are always comfortable. If they don't go through something that is hard, they will never have the opportunity to get stronger. And if they are never put in a situation where they feel uncomfortable or fearful, they will never know what it means to be brave. There is no way that in comfort that we will grow the way that we need to grow. So unfortunately, when I pray for my daughters to be brave and strong, I'm praying that they will be placed in situations that call for strength and bravery, which means I am praying that my girls will not always be comfortable. Now don't misunderstand me. We are always to find our comfort in Christ, and in the identity and grace that comes with him, we should totally find our comfort there. But to find comfort in Christ almost necessitates being uncomfortable in the world. If we're going to seek to find comfort in Jesus, you're not going to be able to have a foot in both worlds and say, well, I'm going to find comfort in this world and in Jesus. I'm going to put them together. I'm going to be super comfortable. It doesn't work that way. Because everything in this world is rigged to try to tell you that it should be easier on you. And Jesus says, I'm not trying to make it easier on you. I'm trying to grow you into something. Ever since we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are being sanctified into the image of Jesus Christ, that we would become more like him. To do that, we will not be comfortable. But the world really desires for you to be comfortable. I want you to think about it right now. If you didn't know this, I guess there's like a sporting event happening today. I've, I've heard. Denver Broncos aren't in it, so it's not real. 
Um, but it's say that you were going to have a Super Bowl party today, and you forgot, oh my goodness, I forgot to order food. While you were in church, I guarantee there was an app on your phone that you could put in all the things that you need, and it will be at your house before you ever got home. Comfort. If you have chores at home that you don't really care to do, there is literally an organization that will go around and clean up your yard after your pets for you. Just an app. You just, if you're willing to pay for it and download the app, they'll do it for you. There is literally an app for everything in our lives to make it easier on us. And in the midst of all that ease, we are being told that we are entitled to or that we deserve to have an easy life that ends with us being healthy, wealthy, and thriving. The world says, wouldn't that be the good life? Wouldn't the good life be if you never had to work really hard, you could just do everything from your fingertip and just have everything brought to you? Wouldn't that just be so good? And you deserve that. You deserve to have it easy. You deserve to have everything done for you. And the world says, and if you can fit Jesus into that, well, that's just dandy. If you can simplify your life so that following Jesus is just a little checklist that you do, like, oh, I did it. I opened up my app. I read my verse of the day, and I'm done. Great. Easy. But the fact of the matter is, following Jesus, Jesus should pinch our lifestyle in this world. If your life does not look vastly different than your non-believing friends because of Jesus in it, I think we're doing something wrong. Jesus isn't just another app that we can use to make our lives easier. He's not a genie in a bottle that grants wishes. He's not a vending machine that's going to give us the things that we want in this world. That's not what it is. Jesus is our Savior. He is our King. To treat Him as such is nothing short of disrespect. Jesus doesn't desire to be an add-on to our life that's there when we want him or need him. Jesus desires to be the thing that we base the entirety of our lives on. Not an add-on. The thing it all depends on. That means that we will sacrifice worldly comfort in pursuit of godly comfort. No one who commits to following Christ and does so lives a life of ease. No one. If your Christianity has not brought discomfort to your life, then something is wrong. I think it's a very valuable thing when somebody repents of their sins, puts their faith in Jesus, that we have them get baptized, but before they get baptized, they stand up here and read a testimony, saying, I was dead in my sins, but Jesus, and now I live for him. Listen, that sounds really easy for me to say, but it is a nerve-wracking thing. It is an uncomfortable thing to stand up here and say, hey, I was totally dead. I was so sinful. It's uncomfortable, but it's right that we start off our Christian journey by saying, I'm uncomfortable, but I believe in Jesus. No one who comes to follow Christ has a life of ease. It's just not true. It should cost us something. Lewis is a, an author. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and some of the greatest Christian literature I can even think of. But he was talking one time and, about giving. And he talked about how Christians should give. And he said something to the effect that Christians should give so much that they're pinched, that they feel it. That if you're not giving enough to the point where you feel hindered uh, in your regular life, then maybe you're not giving enough. The whole point being that we should feel the impact of the finances that we give to the mission. I think C.S. Lewis was right, but I also think that it applies to more than just our finances. I think it talks about our time, our talent, and our treasure. Our worldly lives should totally be impacted because we are following Jesus. Practically, if nothing changed in your life from before you were a believer till now, I don't think that's right. A believer should have less time for worldly things than someone who doesn't believe because we're spending more time following Jesus. Less energy for worldly things because we spent it following Jesus. And we should totally have less money because believers sacrifice generally to help fuel and fund the mission of Jesus Christ. It's totally, and all these things, we should totally feel the pinch. So I have to ask you, does the way you follow Jesus hinder your worldly life? 
Absolutely, I know that because Tracy and I choose to give generously to the mission of Jesus Christ that we don't have money that would be really great in helping us reach our retirement goals. But we've decided to invest in something eternal rather than something worldly. It's the same thing in our time and efforts. I could totally have way more time for myself if I did not do the things I did to try to serve the church. Totally I would have time. Man, I could sleep in more if I didn't prioritize spending time in God's Word and in prayer. I would have way more time for myself. Oh, and think about how I could use my talents to make more money or to do other things if I weren't using them to help further the kingdom of God. Oh, I would have way more time. But if the goal was us being comfortable, and if that's what you really desire, I want to be comfortable in this life, I want to be healthy, wealthy, and thriving, then you're going to be always in direct opposition to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says you need to find your worth and comfort in me. The thing that is most important in C.S. Lewis's point is this. If your life is not, house, is not somehow inconvenienced because of the way you follow Jesus, it begs the question, are you following Jesus? Because following Jesus is uncomfortable. Amen. Verse 59 goes on to say this. To another, he said, this is Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. My second point is this, following Jesus is bigger than our circumstances. Again, this is not Jesus being 100% literal. Jesus is not saying that funerals aren't important or that we should never take the time to mourn our parents. It's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus has attended funerals. Jesus is one of the biggest advocates for honor your father and mother. Jesus was all about showing honor to your parents. Rather, in this case, Jesus is emphasizing the urgency of proclaiming the kingdom of God. Contextually, there was this custom that the burial of the dead was considered a religious duty that took precedence over all other duties, including the study of the law or attending temple. People would use this situation in their life and say, hey, this is the most important thing I'm doing. And Jesus is saying, no, following me is the most important duty in your life. Jesus is merely pointing out that our circumstances do not dictate how we follow and obey. The man's request revealed that he had no concept of the urgency and importance of the task to which Jesus was calling him. The thing Jesus cares the most about is the proclamation of the kingdom of God. When Jesus starts off his ministry, he starts off with repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That is the thing Jesus cares the most about. The glory of God being made known and the kingdom of God growing. See, when Jesus, what Jesus says to the man is follow me. And the man responds with, oh, I will, but, I will, but. See, following Jesus means to be filled with an intense urgency and obedience for the things of Christ. The most common thing I hear today why someone can't follow Jesus the way Jesus calls us to is because of the season that they're in. Have you ever heard that? Oh, I'm just in the season of life. I had a buddy one time who who told me his wife gently rebuked him. He said, oh, babe, it's just a season of life. I, I know I'm not spending much time with the kids. It's just the season of life I'm in. And she responded to him, yeah, and before this season, you were in a different season. And after this season, you'll be in another season. And before you know it, our kids will be grown. The fact of the matter is, the season of life we're in should not dictate our obedience to God. There is not a season that we will go through where God says, hey, don't worry about obeying me or following me. Just handle your stuff. There's no season where that will happen. Because our obedience to God, our followership to Christ, is not circumstantial. There is not a circumstance in life that we can rightly say is a good reason to not follow Jesus. Now, you will totally go through seasons in your life where you should totally tweak your patterns and rhythms of your life. But what I'm afraid of, what I see most often happening is that when something needs to change in our life, the first thing on the chopping blocks are the things of Jesus. Prayer, Bible, church. We say things like, well, you know, I'm so busy right now, I I need to spend time with my family so I can't attend church. 
hey, I could do all these other things in my life, all these recreational things and all the kids' sporting events. Those are fine. But Matthew, we need to spend time as a family so I can't possibly attend church or community group or discipleship. We say things like, hey, yeah, I totally want to give to the church. I totally want to fuel Jesus' mission. I want my heart to be aligned with his. Uh, but, you know, I, but financially right now, we're just in a tight spot. I, 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 we can't really give. But when we look at our bank statements, where do we spend money that we could totally use to fuel the mission of Jesus? Or we say things like, I can't serve, it's a busy season. Or we say, I can't spend time in the Word, I just don't have enough time. And all of those things may be totally true. I believe that you may be in a rough season. I may believe that you need money. I totally believe that you feel like you don't have enough time. So all those may be totally true, but none of them are good, are good reasons to not prioritize the following of Jesus. I'm not saying that the season of life you're in makes following Jesus easy. I bet that's not true. I bet the season in your life sometimes may be hard to follow Jesus. But that's why we call them disciplines and not always delights. Sometimes you have to be disciplined to spend time in the Word, to prioritize prayer, to prioritize the church. You have to be disciplined to say, I'm going to use my time, talents, and treasures for the glory of God first. That's a discipline. It's not something that comes easy. But we should be able to say that if we're going to follow Jesus, seasons of life will not dictate our obedience to Him. And you might be thinking where you're sitting well, Matthew, this feels kind of personal. It seems like you're kind of attacking us. You're, this, this feels personal. And what I would say to that is, your relationship with Jesus is personal. Proverbs twenty-seven nineteen says this, As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of a man reflects the man. The things that we sacrifice our time, talents, and treasure for are the things that have our heart. If you wanted to know where my heart is, you only need to look at my calendar, my bank statement, and where I spend my energy, and that will tell you all you need to know about where my heart is. And that may feel really personal. You may say, whoa, Matthew. Of course it's personal, because matters of the heart are personal. But Jesus doesn't want your mere face value obedience. Jesus says, I want your heart. Jesus says, where your heart is, that's what you're going to follow. Jesus says, give me your heart. He takes it personal when we choose something over him. Of course it's personal. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 says this, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. He said it'd be better if you were cold or hot. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm and are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus says, you got to go all in one way or the other. Jesus doesn't want our leftovers or our convenient worship. Jesus wants obedience and fellowship regardless of our circumstances. So instead of being lukewarm and giving Jesus our leftovers and allowing, him to, allowing our circumstances to dictate whether we will or will not follow Jesus, let us instead have a predisposition to obedience. There's a time in the Old Testament, it's in the book of Joshua. Joshua is to be leading the people of Israel at this time, and they kind of got caught up worshiping false idols and false things, not unlike today. And Joshua, in probably one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, stands up before the people of Israel and says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he says, But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Joshua did not know what his life would bring. Joshua didn't know what adversities would come his way, but he makes a predisposition of obedience. He says, no, I'm deciding right now, me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I'm asking you to do the same thing, that if you're going to follow Jesus, if you say, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, then declare right now, regardless of what happens, regardless of my circumstances, I will serve the Lord. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Totally there's going to be hard times. But Paul says in Romans there, 
allow that testing, allow those seasons you go through to make you stronger in Him, to learn the will of God, to be strengthened by God, and to have your mind transformed. Following Jesus is so much bigger than our circumstantial will come and go. But following Jesus is meant to be the constant in an ever-changing world. So we follow Jesus of our circumstances. Verse 61, it says, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. My third point is this, following Jesus is nothing less than all in. Isn't it an interesting thing? One of the things that stood out while I was studying this text in verse 61 is the man says, I will follow you, Lord. He believes the right thing, that Jesus is Lord. He even has a pretty decent heart posture that says, I want to follow you, Lord. But I got to go say goodbye to those at my home. Following Jesus with an all-in mindset means that, belie- means that we believe that following Jesus is best. You know, sometimes I think we struggle with this idea that God knows best and desires best for us. I think sometimes when we start talking about things like our time, talents, and treasures, it's sometimes hard for us to really intellectually accept that it is best for us that we give those things to the Lord first. Sometimes you can go through a season of life where, is it really best that I give 10% of my income to the Lord? That's best? Yeah, it is, and it won't always feel like it. But to be all in on Jesus, Jesus, I trust you more than I trust myself. So I'm going to believe that what you called me to do is best for my life. Not that it's just good, but that it's best. And it also means that we're going to follow Jesus with an all-in mindset. That means we're not going to have a foot in both worlds. I've used this illustration before, and I asked Noah if I could do it on stage, and he told me, Matt, don't make us carry in more things. But I was going to have two A-frame ladders up here. I think that's why Noah told me no. Also, probably because I would climb them and fall off, and that would probably be bad. But imagine there was two A-frame ladders nestled right up against each other. They were open. One ladder representing the world and our previous life before Christ, and one being our life in Christ. All too often, we're prone to want to have a foot in both worlds. Hey, I want to enjoy the things of this world, but I want to follow Jesus. And we We'll try to kind of balance and have one foot on each ladder, and we try to go up. But at some point, we're not going to be able to do that. Sure, we'll try. We'll say things like, oh, I'm a Christian, but I still still do this thing that's not really God-like. I'm a Christian, but I still want to do this other thing that I kind of do. I'm a Christian, but I'm not willing to, and you just fill in the blank. There's all these, I'm a Christian, but I still blank. There's a bunch of those. But you are forced to make a decision and answer the question, what do you believe is better? You're going to have to pick a ladder. Do you want to pursue Christ or do you want to pursue the things of this world? They both call for you to be all in. You have to pick one. You have to choose which is best for your life, what Jesus promises or what the world promises. And believe me, they both promise the same thing. The world says... I will give you joy, comfort, and fulfillment. And the Lord says, I will give you joy, fulfillment, and comfort. Both say sacrifice for me. The world says, listen, if you're willing to sacrifice for it, you can be healthy, wealthy, and thriving. But I'm telling you, one of them is a liar. So I have to ask the question then, who is your Lord? Which ladder do you want to be on? I use this verse often. Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Man, we love this. This is a good verse. And it's true. The second half of that says that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And we can see how the man in this latter half of this verse totally believes that Jesus is Lord. He believes the right thing about about Jesus. In Romans 10, 9, we see confess Jesus as Lord and believe. What that tells us is that mere belief is not enough. 
confession of Jesus matters. But I think we use that word confess differently than, I intend, than we mean to. In this text, when it says confess, that means to tell the truth. That means to truthfully profess Jesus as Lord. Jesus as Lord means that we get to follow him, that we're going to obey him, that we're not in charge, but we put him in charge. So Romans 10, 9 tells us, if you will follow Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not just believing the right things, but also submitting to Jesus as Lord. So it begs the question, who is Lord in your life? You can't have two masters. Jesus says in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. There's no way you can have a foot in both worlds. Like two ladders, you must decide. Will you turn your back on Jesus in pursuit of the things of this world? Or will you abandon the things of this world and the life it offers for the eternal life that Jesus offers? Both require a sacrifice. The world says, sacrifice and I will give you everything. Jesus says, I sacrificed my life to give you everything. Everything that you could ever need, Jesus says, I sacrificed my life to give it to you. So maybe you are sitting there today and you identify as someone who's been living with a foot in both worlds. Or maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're like, no, I've been both feet in this world, Matthew. I want to tell you, will you take that step today to confess your sins, believe in the resurrection, and commit to follow Jesus? If so, you could totally be a Christian today. If you repent of your sins, but your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a Christian and if that's you, if you want to make that commitment today, and this is the first time, I want you to tell me after service, I want you to come up to me and say, Matthew, I made that decision today. You know, every week I like to ask the question, Community Life Church, what do I want you to do? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go all in on Jesus, because that is what it would cost. I started with the question, what would it cost to follow Jesus? Well, the answer is it would cost you being all in on Jesus. So I want you to go all in, even when it's uncomfortable. Regardless of your circumstances, believing that Jesus is best. Not even just that Jesus is better, but believing that Jesus is best. And then I wonder, if like Joshua before the Israelites, could you say, when asked, choose you this day whom you will serve, can you say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for the life that can be found in you, for all those who repent of their sins and put their faith in you. And God, I thank you for this clear truth that following you is nothing less than all in. God, you don't want our leftovers. You don't want our to do list, God, you want our heart. And to do that means that we have to be all in. It means that we obey you regardless of how we feel about it. God, that we follow you when it's uncomfortable. And we know that there's going to be discomfort along the way. We know that's coming. But God, you call us to follow you even when it's uncomfortable. You call us to follow you even in the midst of crazy circumstances. Regardless of our circumstances, we are to follow you. God, you desire for us to be all in with you. And God, I just pray that we would be a people resolute in that, that we have a predisposition to obedience, that when asked who we serve, we say we serve the Lord. Who doesn't yet know you, I pray that they would put their faith in you, that they'd go all in with you today. Because I know that if they'll do that, God, you adopt them into your family as a child of God. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.